So the session is being recorded. Everyone behave. <laughs> oh, you know better than that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, this monthly meeting of uh, Gameaholics Anonymous. Um, I would like to welcome you to this conference. Please, everyone, give a warm welcome to our newest member, Nai Wang. Oh my gosh, there's real people here. Oh, okay, I guess I gotta get out and, and oh, this is, this is really scary here. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, I, I am here this morning, very happy and, and enthusiastically here to say that I am a gameaholic. <laughs> I've been sober for two years and <clears throat> since something happened that really affected me drastically, and I think it might have affected you, the pandemic. So when the pandemic happened, things changed. I was I met with massive challenges. I gained 20 pounds overnight. <laughs> My hair grew long because I couldn't get it cut. And something else drastically happened. <laughs> My hair changed colors. Did, any, did this happen to anyone else? <laughs> and the story goes, I was going to get my hair cut. I'm like, well, if I'm going to cut it all off, I might as well do something with it. And then what, one thing led to another, and now it's an addiction. <laughs> I've always had short hair. So this is me pre-pandemic. Normal, ordinary, Asian guy. <laughs> and short hair. So the pandemic do, right? really changed a lot. Um, for me, I got into VR, uh, and that, that was, well, I'll speak about that later, an eye-opening experience, other than being locked at home all the time. <laughs> so anyone else face any massive challenges during the uh, pandemic that uh, they'd like to share? <laughs> major, major changes? I did so many things I never thought I'd ever do in my life like this. Um, nope, no one wants to share. All right, let's move on. All right, so let's go to our agenda. Now, this is going to be a fun and enthusiastic uh, meeting, even though it's 8 a.m. I know nobody's awake yet, so, so my job here is to wake you up and give you some enlightenment. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the video game industry, because it's really huge, and how it affects education because whether you like it or not, it's really changing these kids and the way they learn. And I'm gonna give you an example of gamification and something that I did in mathematics that actually worked. So you can see kind of like what gamification does uh, to kids when you actually do it properly. Um, we're gonna get you into the minds of the gamers. So that's a, the entire premise of this is to get you to know what's going on in here well, you don't even want to know what's going on here. But to kind of give you a little glimpse of what a gamer's mind is like, because those minds are very different. Unless if you're a gamer yourself, you know that gamer's minds are different than adult minds. I'm talking about you. Then we're going to talk a little bit about strategies and practices that you could take into your classroom, and hopefully we'll have time for some Q&A. So prepare yourselves to crank it up to 11. <laughs> well, let's go to warp speed. Any trekkies here? <laughs> yeah, awesome. We're going to take it to ludicrous speed. <laughs> There's got a few of you there. Still remember, space balls. All right, this is going to be a massive brain dump. So, so I'm going to be relaying so much information that you're, you're going you're to feel like your mind's going to explode, but in a good way. In fact, in the past, I've been speaking about this topic for six, six or seven years now, I can't re recall the past two years, but, uh, but teachers have come up to me and said, oh my gosh, I've taken 20 pages of notes. And I'm like, you took 20 pages of notes based on what I'm talking about? I'm like, yeah, so they showed me. <laughs> so, you know, maybe anyone want to go for 21? <laughs> anyway, so, oh, this thing popped up accidentally, but 
I'm going to talk a little, so a little bit about myself. Um, I had some disadvantages growing up. Anybody here had disadvantages growing up? Yeah? Okay. Your students have too. So first off, I was made in Taiwan. <laughs> yes, it's still funny. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I grew up in a Chinese restaurant. So when my parents you know, immigrated here to the United States, you know, like most immigrant families uh, from Taiwan, they opened up a restaurant. And I grew up in that restaurant, working day and night and day and night, nights and weekends, holidays. Yeah, it was fun. So because I was um, all that, um, I actually was English as a second language, so I had to go through two years of speech class when I was in grade school. As you can see, those, uh, those uh, teachers did a very good job. <laughs> and, uh, and I had a lot of reading challenges because I was like, you know, bouncing between the two languages, a symbolic language and a romantic language, so we don't get into the whole entire language thing. But, but uh, as a result, I got ADHD. Anybody know any of the kids with ADHD? Yes. <laughs> yes. In fact, I think everyone has it now. Um, so at the time, you know, it was a it was a new thing, and I also failed a math class. And you know, when when I was a normal haired Chinese guy, you know, it you know it was a, you know math is actually supposed to be born in our DNA, and, and it's not. You know, so I actually you know not because I was not good at it, it was because I was not able to pay attention to uh, those classes as well. So because of that, and this slide, this uh, point was up for some reason, um, I had to deal with it um, naturally, not chemically, because because we were we had a restaurant, we were like living not paycheck to paycheck, but you know it's like you know you, you're very economically challenged, and and my parents couldn't afford to, to put me on meds, which was a good thing because what happened was I learned I had superpowers, I could fly. No, I couldn't. Um, I turned my disadvantages into my superpower. So I so because of that I had to learn to work with my ADHD in school in college and what it did was it gave me heightened senses so I could look out in the world and I could see and perceive more things than my average peers like just because I had this like ability to kind of pull in information and my brain is able to process it um, and I just don't even know how it's just that that's just the way I am uh, so because of that I call it like multi-point perception so. Because when you're playing video games, like you have like all this data coming at you, and you're able to process all the data at once without really even focusing on it. It just kind of comes at you, and you just know it. Like one of my favorite games is like the game genre called Bullet Hell, where you see like a thousand things coming at you, and you're like this little plane, and you have to dodge all these bullets, and somehow you're able to make it through that maze of of of, um, of enemies and things like that. So those are games I love because they just really challenge my brain. Um, so because of that, I decided I want to become a programmer and make my own games. So I found myself programming at a very young age. Then I went into education because of my restaurant background. I uh, got in with uh, culinary arts education and decided, hey, I want to do that and make it uh, and gamify that at the same time. And then uh, that led me to the Math Fluency Project, which I'll show you a little about how we gamify math. Is successfully, and then my latest thing just uh, uh, that I'm doing is now I'm taking the gamification process that I'm doing, and I'm make, making it available for teachers to to create and craft um, lessons and, and, and work together at a collaborative <coughs> environment called KP Hub U, and actually that actually started January of this year. So this is a really exciting new project that I'm doing, so that we can bring gamification into all of education in all sectors. So, so. We live in an instant gratification generation. Uh, okay, we're going to stick this in here, and then I'm going to pour in the milk. <laughs> I hope this works because I didn't bring a change of pants. Look, I googled it. It's a fake picture. <laughs> That's it. No cake for you. Anyone else want to join the no cake club? She's <laughs> just kidding, boys and girls. Everyone gets a cake. I love the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> they're so much fun. Um, and sadly, they're off the air. But we can still watch reruns and binge them. So this, this slide, I love this clip because you know it, these kids grew up with information in their hands. They don't know the struggles that we had to go through. And I think some of you probably don't even know it because you're younger teachers. But back in the day, we had to go to a library, right? <laughs> and we 
have to use these cards called what? You know, using what system? Dewey Decimal. Anybody know? Card anybody not know? Cal card Cal Anybody not know that here? Uh, you don't have to raise your hand. And then we had to go and pull out the card and go walk okay. to a location and go, darn it, it's not there. <laughs> Somebody put misfiled it and then you give up. Uh, or even worse, let's say you go to search this, uh, this little uh, ribbon of film called what? Microfish, yes. And then to do your research project, you spend days and days trying to sort through these articles, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so much work. I'm going to base my entire thesis on this, these three articles because I just don't have time to, to do anymore. But, so we don't have to do that anymore. Google's a quick search, we can find tons and tons of data. So these kids, they're, that's all they're expecting. Uh, it's not about what they know, it's about how they know to get there. So where did this all begin? You know, uh, with the video game thing. All right, so starting with this. Pong, yes. The, this looks so simple now, but back then this was like mind blowing that people can then manipulate a controller, <coughs> cause a non tangible object to do things in a virtual world, which is the, the digital world. And that to, to us humans was something that was that's never been thought of before because we were we're all tangible people. So now we're going into this digital age, and from that spawn some other games that we all know and love: Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, and then we go into Super Mario Brothers. Yeah, and then and, and as you see over time, these game, games got more and more complex. Graphics got more sophisticated. The speed uh, of of which also changed, and then the huge game changer that happened was Pokemon Go in 2016. Any, any trainers here? Oh, right, awesome. Anybody gonna go on a raid tonight for, uh, I think it's Moltres, right, for uh, the, the, um, the boss battles. Oh, I mean the, the raid uh, legendaries. 6 p.m. Okay, so anyway, so. <laughs> yes, I love it. Um, so Pokemon it, it has such a huge influence on the gaming industry. Because as kids or as adults, you know, when we were kids, we watched the shows, we played the games, we played the Game Boys, and when it came out, it became a phenomenon not just for kids but for adults as well. And what happened was, like, you know, people actually got off their couches, went out into the real world, and and caught these Pokemon instead of sitting at home or or on their devices. And things like this happened, where people gathered in a park and a Bulbasaur showed up, and the guy, <laughs> and people were just so excited to catch these Pokemon. I mean, it's like it's just insane how how, how the people reacted to it. just this one simple game where you catch these little animals on on, on uh, your screen. Then the next game changer came, which was Fortnite in 2018, which was a free-to-play game, so you don't have to pay any money for it. Of course, people did pay money for it. But the thing is, like you know, this allowed people to compete in, and really changed the nature of, of how uh, gaming happened. And then uh, in 2020, uh, 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 Meta, or formerly known as Oculus, uh, came out with the uh, the, the uh, Oculus Quest 2. So the one was good, but didn't have huge adoption. But when the two came out, and on top of that was the pandemic, that thing flew off the shelf, and everyone. The people who weren't uh, gamers actually were have gotten into this. In fact, when I started playing it, I was meeting like 40, 50, 60 year olds in these games. And like, like it, was, it wasn't just kids, like adults were playing, like you know, people with full-time jobs and they, and they go into these virtual worlds to relax. So are there any games here? So let's start with like arcades. So raise your hand, who started playing games in the arcades where you had to go to like a smoky bar or pizza or pizza? <laughs> yeah, okay, good, yeah, we had a few of you. So. So, you know, we had to actually go someplace to play these games at an arcade. Then who here started playing games in consoles, okay? All right, good, yeah. So this is when we actually were able to take these legendary games like Golden Axe and play it at home uh, or, or Pac-Man. Uh, and that, that really, really changed the nature of things because now you play it in your living room. And then who's, who's a PC gamer? So anybody here PC gamers? Okay, not, not as many anymore. But PCs were originally intended to be productivity machines, and then for some reason I was playing SimCity on them. <laughs> uh, and then uh, portable gaming, so Game Boys. Anybody started playing on like Game Boys or handhelds like that? Okay, cool, a few of you. All right, so then we go into smartphones. Uh, uh, anybody play games on their smartphones now? Okay, so, so that's when, when you start playing games on smartphones. 
Yeah, so smartphones made it ubiquitous. Now all these like communication devices which you're supposed to use to talk to people are now not phones anymore. So 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 now there's a huge there's a these game developers are able to reach a uh, much uh, more larger level than ever before. And then any VR gamers in here? Just out of curiosity, any VR gamers? Oh, cool. We have a little bit. A little bit. Okay. So all of you are 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 VR virgins. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. So then, the last thing I always point out is like solitaire. Anybody play solitaire? All right. You're a gamer because solitaire is a game, uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, words with friends or Wordle. So there we go. So these are all forms of games that that, that people have, and it all incorporates gamification, which is what drives uh, your engagement. So let's look at this uh, and how the entertainment industry has shaped our brains. So back in the day, we had the television, and the television was the root of all evil, right? <laughs> so, but but the thing is, like you know, as as children, you know, your parents were very busy, and you go, okay, sit in front of TV and, and watch these cartoons, and so so you learned at a very young age that okay, you know, for me to get my entertainment, I'm going to sit in front of TV. And then basically passively absorb the information. I'm going to laugh, I'm going to cry, I'm going to form uh, associations with these characters uh, because I'm building a relationship with them in a way. Uh, and, uh, and you become uh, a Disney fan, you go to Disneyland and buy those mouse ears, even though they look ridiculous on you, uh, because, because you, you love these things. And, as, and then when you go to school, teachers are standing in front of you, lecturing at you, and you're like going, hey, this makes sense because when I was a kid, I sat in front of TV and information was being doled out to me. Uh, and, and I accept that because that's how I was trained. But then when video games came out, things changed because instead of having a passive narrative being done to you, you are now actively controlling these avatars. And you're actually engaged in what you do. And you're making decisions on, on how you want to go about these levels. And you're, 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 you're trying to do the best you can in, in, in very uh, different circumstances and experimenting on different ways to, to get to your end goal. Uh, and then when you go to school, the teacher's standing in front of you, lecturing at you, and you're sitting there going, man, when I was a kid, I was playing these games, I was making these decisions, I was, I was actively engaged, and now I'm just sitting here being lectured at, and this is so boring, and I want to make decisions, I want to be an active learner, but for some reason, this teacher just wants to be talking at me, and I just can't stand anymore, and what happens? They go to sleep, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. so, so, this, so the entertainment industry really has changed the ways that, that, that these students have uh, want their information given to them with choice, with decisions, with, with consequences, and with ways to grow. So, so this is the, uh, the way that we are. So now let's look at video games as an addiction. Because in 2018, the WHO formally announced that video game addiction is a real thing. Before, people were like, oh, you just can't control yourself. Oh, you don't have discipline. But, but they actually formally acknowledged that, yes, this is an actual addiction. Not a chemical one, but a more like a psychological one. So, <coughs> so what happened is, is uh, why is video games so addicting? Well, first off, most important, it's a temporary escape. So you're in your real world, it's really awful, I don't like it, so I'm gonna go up to this uh, video game world and, and be entertained by it, uh, or in VR, this virtual world. Uh, it actually contains uh, uh, some social <laughs> aspects to it, so because of um, multiplayer games are now massively huge. So they form these player groups and you have identity with these groups, but you can also be anonymous. So you can be anybody and anything while you're in this world. So you can be your true self in a way. These video games also are challenging and they have an end goal. So these goals are what drives these and motivates these students to, to get into these games. And the most important one of all is constant measurable growth. They're being fed so much information, <coughs> constantly saying, hey, you did great, you got three stars, you got five stars, you earned 500 XP, you, or you got 300 gold, you, know, you earned this item. So you're constantly seeing an accumulation of growth rather than waiting later for a result of some sort of assessment. So this constant measurable growth is really what triggers the dopamine in our brains. 
So, anybody here watched the player, Ready Player One? Okay. Anybody not watch player, Ready Player One yet? Okay, a few of you. You should watch that movie because this will really give you a really great glimpse into the gaming uh, world. But this little clip here, I love, and I'm going to fast forward. There's nowhere left to go. Nowhere. So, this is basically Except saying that you're in a dystopian society, and this is the only escape from the real world. So he said, you know, they come to the Oasis for all the things you can do, but you, you stay because of all the things that you can be. So when I entered into the VR world, it felt just like this. It did not look like this, but you, you get those, the same feelings, the same um, experiences. And, and I could actually do a whole talk on, on, uh, on virtual reality now uh, in the tech media. Well, um, you know, I read this really amazing book called Reality Plus, which, are, which is a philosophy book about how virtual reality is reality now. And reality may be virtual reality, so we might be in a virtual construct. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Can you argue that point? <laughs> uh, oops. And then, uh, so, so to, to me, like AR and VR is the future of education. In fact, uh, in, the, uh, in the vendor hall, there's this new startup company that just started two years ago, who's using the Oculus to build virtual simulations uh, uh, and so that kids can go through different uh, orientations and tasks and familiarize, familiarize themselves in this VR world. So much more immersive than watching a video, so much more immersive than doing AR, because you're actually, you actually feel like you're in this environment. And that will translate to actual tangible skills in the future. So, so I believe that, I definitely know that uh, it's coming. And when I put that slide up, I said it's the future. Actually, it's here now, and it's gonna, it's gonna happen. You know, five, three years ago, it's like, oh yeah, that's just a fad, and it's never gonna be, be real. But uh, it is, and it's amazing. So if you haven't had a chance to see that in the vendor hall, um, it is absolutely amazing. So just look for the booth with the people holding these uh, Oculuses and uh, and putting it on your head and saying, check this out, okay? <laughs> okay, so we are now talking about the Maslow's hierarchy of gaming needs. So what happens is like, you know, what these video games do is it gives you a sense of belonging. It creates social interactions within the group so, so you have this, this connection now. It also builds self-esteem, which which comes from overcoming challenges. So as you're accomplishing these goals, as you're earning these points, you will become more self-aware and, and become more confident because you're like, I have these skills and abilities now. Do they translate to the real world? Maybe, maybe not, but that's what the video game does. And it actually creates self-actualization. So you're actually contributing to a living world. So, so in these games and these communities, you feel like you're, you're building something. You're not just playing these games and passively entertaining. Like if you're playing Minecraft, you're building these worlds. If you're, if you're playing these uh, long online games, you're creating guilds, you're creating community, you're, you're, you're building assets. Uh, and in fact, like you know, in the virtual world, they're saying that it's gonna be a, a, a multi-billion dollar industry of, of digital assets because to the kids, Digital assets are just as important as physical assets now. There is no difference to them. Where we used to covet like an item or a thing, they covet a specialized, like you know, like NFTs, you know, a specialized item that's rare to the, from, the, from the game developer. So the game developers are creating these rules and, and making these things desirable. So um, as you can see here, I'm fil filming this. But also on top of that, we have the PowerPoint, which is around 500 megabytes right now, which I can't email to people because it contains all the video. So if you go to this uh, site, KPKPKP, there's a Google form that says, what's your email? What, what are you interested in down, uh, receiving? And then we'll, we'll make it available. And we have like uh, articles and resources and uh, lots of additional information that I can't convey, like scholarly articles and things like, you know, that's more intelligent than I am. <laughs> uh, uh, talk about this. So just go to that site, uh, fill out that uh, form, and then we'll, uh, 
when I get back and download the video and upload it, and uh, uh, we'll send it off to you. So KP, 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 very easy to remember. So video games are a multi-billion dollar industry, as you know. So it, it started become, I started becoming aware of that in 2015 when I was watching the Super Bowl. So when we watch Super Bowls, you see ads for beer, cars, the next movie, uh, Doritos or something like that. But when uh, when the, uh, the oh, when when the ad come out for Clash of Clans Clans happened, I was like, wait, this is a mobile game I play for free. How are they afford? How can they afford a million dollar spot in a football game? Because these are like these mobile games. Like you don't really think much of it. It's a free game. I play it. You know, it's fun. You build these these like, you know, um, bases and people attack it, you attack other people, and I, and I don't spend any money on it. But apparently people do, because they actually made around $5,573,127. Okay, that may seem like a lot or not a lot, but if you count that, that's how much they make in a day. So it's like, oh, that's, that's a lot of money for a, for a free game, right? So, so back then, this is back then, these figures were back then. You know, now they're insane. But, but that's how they're able to afford it, because these free games, they get you hooked, and they go, oh, pay a dollar to do this, pay a dollar to do that. Oh, if you pay $10, you'll get this bonus item, and things like that. You're like, oh yeah, $10, that's like one hour of work, I'll gladly give you $10 for that. It's amazing. So what happens is like, you know, so now, video game industry is a 200, billion dollar industry. Pretty big, right? Now let's take compare that in contrast to the movie industry pre-pandemic. You know, movie industry is pretty big, right? Everyone knows like these movies are huge, they're block they have blockbusters, and they make a lot of money, right? They, you know, we got the Marvel franchise and, and the Star Wars franchises and, and, and all that. But let's compare it. They only make forty one billion dollars. So all these movies that take so much time to produce and so much, uh, so much effort only made forty-one billion dollars in twenty nineteen, as compared to two hundred billion. In fact, look at this growth trajectory. How, how the video, how the game industry is, and you'll notice the blue just explode. So the blue represents mobile gaming. So PC gaming hasn't changed much. In fact, it's declined to nineteen uh, percent. You know, where it was a larger portion of it. And in console games has declined from 45% down to 22%. And this is $180 billion as of 2021, 100, uh, $200 billion projected for 2022. That's a lot of money, right? So like, like anything, where there's, where there's uh, money to be made, that's where tons of investments will be done. So because of that, video games, are creating an addiction because they want you to buy their product. They're not giving you drugs, but they're, they're giving you the effects of drugs. So we have to deal with that because we can't say don't play video games anymore. That's not gonna happen. So we just have to live with it and, and use that as a tool to reach our students. So anybody here heard of eSports? Okay, I don't see how you cannot hear about eSports because the entire conference is about eSports sports. In fact, the, uh, SREB and Making Schools Work tasked me to help build their eSports arena, which is actually in the, uh, in the uh, expo hall. And, and I got, gathered about a dozen teachers to come. So, so basically, I <laughs> helped put on the eSports thing at this conference. And, and we went from one, one um, session about that to about a dozen sessions. Anyway, but so eSports is this like growing phenomenon where these kids get together in an arena pre-pandemic, and now they're trying to get back to it again. And they would play video games together, and they would compete. So you think of it like playing football, but on uh, or playing any kind of sports game, uh, but now uh, using video games. In fact, these uh, sports games are so popular that if we look at the video of the league, so this is the coverage of Overwatch, and you can see this. Like these are just nerdy kids who typically are just sitting at home playing video games, and now they're being showcased on stage in front of an international audience, and having so much, as much fame as a pro athlete. 
So it's amazing how this completely transformed him. Look at that kid. Like he's like, I'm a total badass. Look at him. I'm just a tiger you and look at my concentration of you. I'm going to take you out. There you go. So, so you can see that you know, these are just ordinary kids. Like they're not pro athletes, but, but they're being showcased like pro athletes. And these are the, the things that these kids, when they're playing these games, they're looking at this and go, I could be that guy. This is accessible to me. I'm not good. I'm, I'm, I'm not as tall as LeBron James. I'm not as talented as Tiger Woods. But hey, I play video games and I could be like that. In fact, you know, esports has had more viewership than regular sports on Twitch. So you think like you know these kids are watching more. There's more people watching that, and because of that, advertisers are flocking to esports now because. Where do people go? Advertisers go. Making a ton of money. Yes, sir. Question, what's the percentage of people who actually make good money off of eSports versus the amount of people who are trying to be in eSports? Well, probably around the same percentage as that's the real athletes. That's, 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 what, yeah. that's what I was wondering. But, but the thing is, it's more accessible and there's a larger variety sure. of sports as well. So we're not just locked down to football, baseball, sure. basketball, uh, and, and some subgenres. Like every single game has their own niches and some are bigger than the other. So there's a lot more opportunity to be a, a, a champion of, of different types of esports. Um, very good question. So, and in fact, anyone, if anyone has any questions during the session, you know, feel free to raise your hand, and I might call on you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, so so colleges are recognizing this, and uh, and he, as far as like uh, 2018, um, they were offering scholarships to these esports champions to get them into their colleges now. So, so, so it is a very valuable asset to be a good video gamer now, right? In fact, you know, has anyone heard of Ninja on Twitch? Anybody here heard of Ninja? Okay, only a few of you. So Ninja is this YouTuber or Twitch streamer who plays, who does nothing but play video games. So he goes on his computer, he plays video games. And that's all he does. And he, he has commentary and personality. So this guy is, a, is one of the most popular streamers on the web. And all he does is play video games. He has about 4 million subscribers watching his channel. So whenever he gets online, people come and they watch him live. Now, they don't wait to watch a video, they actually watch him live. So these are people who are really anticipating his uh, gaming. So he has made $700,000, but that's a figure for his monthly income for playing video games. Okay, would you like to make $700,000 a month playing video games? So you gotta think about this. These kids are watching Ninja, and they're like, "Wow, Ninja's cool." He, if you <laughs> add endorsements into this, so now he's got all these this audience. He's an influencer now. People are like, "Oh, let's give him money." He has made approximately a hundred million million dollars as of 2021. That's estimated because they're you know he's not disclosing his week, but hundred million dollars for playing video games. So these kids look to Twitch, which is this guy, and they're like, they idolize him. They want to be him. They think I could make a hundred billion dollars. So anyway, because of this, because of how video games are, are such a huge factor in our lives, in their lives, you know, it's a big deal in education. So, so, so teachers are actually starting to form leagues you know, in, in, in uh, esports. They're getting together, and these esports have the same effect as traditional sports because you're working together in teams, you're doing all this stuff. And in fact, I'm not going to go through this information in detail because there's so many other sessions. So if you're interested in esports, go to those sessions. But the best part about this is uh, diversity and accessibility for traditional non participants. So kids who don't normally join clubs for any reason, they're like, oh, I could join the esports club and be a part of that. So it creates a sense of belonging. It increases attendance because now they have something to look forward to. And somebody brought Krispy Kreme to the room and not Sherry. Oh my gosh, you can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. Oh, oh gosh. I'm sorry. Giant box of Krispy Kreme. You got Sherry now. Uh, it creates uh, student and family engagement. So families get involved. And let's not even talk about SEL, how much that makes a huge difference in that. So, so, so because we are promoting esports so much at this conference, we have so many sessions. 
Uh, today I have a student panel, so we got about a dozen. Well, we're at the arena, we're, we have 40 students coming in from all around the um, the uh, the area, and they're coming in. And they're gonna, we're going to put on mock tournaments so you can kind of see what a real esports uh, tournament is like and how, how excited these kids are about doing it. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to have a student panel where so we're going to uh, gather a group of students, and they're going to talk about their experiences, how it's affected their lives. And who, who doesn't love hearing student, uh, students, uh, stories from students, right? So, we, so it's a very powerful session uh, this afternoon. Tomorrow I'm going to be doing a one-on-one -on -one panel, how to get started. We're going to have uh, the four guest speakers talking about all various aspects of getting started. And also, like you know, today we have a Minecraft uh, uh, session going on, how to implement game concepts, uh, CD pathway, and many, many more. So there's a lot of these parts. But the most important thing about this entire session that I want to bring that back is to build empathy in your minds. Because when you look at these kids, you're like, oh, you know, they're, 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 they're foreign aliens. So, so the more you know about like, you know, these kids growing up from elementary school through middle school to high school and college, you know, they're not just students, but they're, they're gamers. And if you have a better understanding of these gamers, the more you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good little, little classic. Well, I love this one. Now we know. I guess half the Knowing is half the battle. <laughs> yes. So, I love that. Um, so basically, we're accelerating to the accelerated yeah. mind. Because of, well, like I was describing earlier, these kids' minds are moving at a million miles per minute. So we're only using like about 10% of our brain approximately or so. So there's so much untapped potentials. And what this, these games are is, 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 is almost like tapping into these other parts of our brains. Uh, so if we watch this, this is a game called Overwatch that I showed you earlier. But this is a gamer playing a game called Blink. So you can see things are moving pretty fast, right? They're like, oh gosh, you know, how, how could I comprehend uh, all this? Uh, so you're like, oh, yeah, they're shooting at people. OK, good, that's, that's good. We're shooting. But let's, let's, oops, let me go back. Um, is that meant to pause it? OK, pause. So but, but let's look at this for a second here. What's going on is like the person's focused on this, but then we also have this information saying who got who killed who. We have this information, which is your health and your shield. And then we have this information, which is basically you have your, your weapon and your two specials, which when you use it, it takes time to charge and you, and you only can use it so often. And then you have this data here, which is showing your team and how their health is doing. So you can see how your team members are doing. And you can see this team is doing pretty well, whereas this team is not doing very well. So we have two team members going on. And we have our, our, our different uh, kill data points, uh, and then we have our score. So the, the, the kid who's playing this is, is taking in all this information at once and processing it and, and understanding where they're, what they're doing, where they're at, where people are at, and not to mention that on screen you can see where the other players are going, doing as well. So talk about crazy. I mean, I could barely keep up with this. And if I was younger, I probably could. But <laughs> But the thing is, like, I wasn't trained at that level of absorption and operation. I mean, I was trained at a, a certain level, but these kids far uh, surpassed me. So how do we meet them at that level? So let's look at the gamification done correctly in the math program. So, so this is a kid who basically started counting on their fingers. A fourth grader, uh, south side of Phoenix. And basically we asked them, what's five plus four? And they go, you, you know these kids, are, they, they count on their fingers. And this is him after about two months of run uh, of playing a math game. You've probably heard of other math games like Prodigy and uh, Alex and all that kind of stuff. So this is a game, and you can see it's nothing glitzy, right? And he's answering these math problems, answering solving for x, and he's getting all these questions correct. And how is he able to do this? He answers around 500 questions correctly a day. How do you get a kid to practice 500 questions a day? You can't, right? But you're able to if you do gamification properly. So what happened is like he started at level one, answering one plus one, one plus two. And like any video game, you start at level one, you may be good up to level 10, but then you're like, oh, level 11, I'm not good at it. So if I put you in a video game, you, you probably would be good up to level three. But if I put another kid against you, they probably beat you and go up to level 30 in like five minutes, right? So the thing is, like, you, each kid has their own abilities and they're playing at their maximum ability. And then uh, this is him at about uh, um, a couple, 
couple of months later, so more complex questions, word problems, uh, and you know. So the beauty of this, and, and I'm only jumping through this, this is building confidence. So now they're going, I am good at math. I love this. This is so much fun. And I'm seeing word problems now. Yay. So they, 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 they level up and they do it every day because, and they want to do it because we, we created this uh, environment yeah. where so do you guys, guys want to go home? No! Do you want to keep playing? <laughs> So it's just the thing is like you see that the, that wasn't a game, but they're just answering math problems. But we made it like a video game because we had badges, we had a goal, that the class goal. So as a class, the, the kids are contributing towards a communal goal. Uh, they're racing against other classes as well, so there's competition, uh, and they see points going up. So all this data is is valuable to them. They love this information. In fact, when when like we've had cases where our our board did not work for a game, and the kids like completely degenerated because they didn't have this data or this feedback. They're like, they, this is so much, so motivating to them. You know, so this progress bar shows what's important, incremental growth. In fact, like the you know, individual students have their own goals, so they have their personalized goals, and they can see that every kid has their own personalized goals. So some kids have larger goals, some kids have smaller goals, but they are all adjusted to their own personal ability. And let's say you can only make it to level three in, in, in five minutes, and then you can make it to level five in, in five minutes. So we say you're gonna to get to level five, you're gonna to get to level three, and you feel accomplished even though you're at level three and you're at level five. So so that's the whole entire thing. It's like, and then the teachers will be able to say, okay, this student is lacking behind. Why? Well, they hit a new standard that's challenging them, and then they can perform real-time intervention and actually help and deal with that student right then and there instead of waiting for the report to come in at the end of the day or at the end of the week and go, okay, now I have to do an IEP or something like that. So this lets you do like what we call real-time diagnosis. So this, so with technology, uh, it makes it so that you know these kids are like honestly, like once you get in there and you just get going, you completely forget that you're even doing math. It's honestly just really fun. So this is a high school kid at an alternative high school. I'm not gonna show these videos, but these are teachers saying, wow. Anyway, uh, so it's based on nine century primitive tools, and I have a session at 11 o'clock today that goes really in depth into the science behind it and talk about it as well. Was that your question? Uh, is it, so that's all like a custom built web platform that you have? Yes, okay. exactly. And we're looking for, for more research and more, more schools to participate in our study. So, all right, so let's look at their language. Okay, so first off, let's talk about grinding. You know, so grinding is a, is a mechanic in video games. And we hear kids say, oh, I gotta go grind that level. That doesn't mean they have to go grind a millstone or, or something like that, or do a dance move. That means that they have to go and, and do, a, do a task in, in a game. So for example, I played a game a long time ago called EverQuest. Anybody remember that? Okay. Um, so basically, I, I had to go and, 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 and fish. So I would go buy a fishing pole, go to the water, and hit the fish button. And I would sit there for about 10 minutes and fish. And I would catch fish, and I'd be like, level one, level two, level three. So my goal is, okay, I want to get to level 10, so I could guide, once I do that, then I could buy the golden rod, then I, could, then I could purchase, use that golden rod to catch a rainbow, rainbow trout. And when I catch a rainbow trout after about eight hours, then I would you know, go trade that rainbow trout for the ultimate sword of destruction, or something like that. So, so, so basically I'm grinding through this, uh, this game just to do that thing. Farming is another term that where basically you're doing not just one task, but multiple tasks at once. You're going, okay, I gotta do this, I gotta do that task, I gotta go here, do that, and then leave the game and then the level reset and I'll do the whole process over again. Typically with very little change, you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. All right, and then the kids go on a raid. So this is when you're in multiplayer games and they get together as a team. One person might be a magician, another might be a fighter, another might be a healer, and they would go into a dungeon and they would tackle on the dragon or something like that. So it requires a lot of teamwork. So, uh, and then there's another term called speed run. So um, a lot of people probably haven't heard of this term before, but basically this is a challenge where, let's say you play a level and you beat it in five minutes and 38 seconds, and then you go to the lead board and you see your friend beat it in five minutes and 25 seconds. You're like, how in the world did you do that? So you go back to the game and you play it for three hours perfecting every single little move in that level to make sure to shave off 
uh, eight seconds so you can beat your friend. So that's what a speed run is. It's basically going, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to do this over and over again until I can perfect my, my, uh, my process through the game. And then the last one is a 100 percenter. So you probably have these OCD kids where like, they have to complete everything uh, in a task or something like that. You know, like, like for example, uh, in the culinary program we have, we have a mastery system. So that so we have to turn everything. You don't have to turn everything yellow, but we have these kids say, "I need to turn everything yellow." Oh, not yellow, green. I turn everything green, and they would go into this mode because they are programmed to become 100 percenters. They have to do everything. They have to do it 100 percent. They have to get all the achievements. So when you play a normal video game, you're like, "Okay, you know, I've completed a game." They'll say, "You have completed 70 percent." Like, well, I finished the game. Well, there's, there's all these side quests. There's all these other things. There's collectibles. So these game, these game developers put in all this other extra stuff, even though you finish the game, there's more, there's more, more, there's more, there's always more. And uh, that's how they hook you. So when you think about grinding, what does this equate to? Remediation. So basically, video games get the students to remediate content, doing meaningless tasks over and over again. So they can get these kids to do these meaningless tasks over, over and over again, because they're being rewarded by incremental growth. And these rewards are done through goals and special items and abilities. So all these little things add up to something bigger. And that, that's what the kids keep their eye on. It's like something bigger. Even though I'm doing this over and over again, I've got my eye on the prize. And we can use that in, in education as you know, keep your eye on the prize. Let's just give lots of little feedback and grow them towards the goal. And I have to remind everyone that when you use gamification, it's not creating a video game or game-based learning. It's actually using the psychology and principles of gamification. So there's a lot of games out there that teach learning, like Prodigy, like Math, Prodigy for Math. But that's that's a game which actually doesn't create a lot of outcome. But the thing is, like you know, we want to incorporate these principles because then if we incorporate these principles, then we can uh, uh, bring it into our daily lives. So we have a few steps to gamification. Well, first thing is like you, know, you have to know your audience. Then you have to develop, define clear learning objectives. So you know, which we already have. We develop lesson plans. So we're already doing these in practice. And especially, you know, we have to explain why. You know, really get the relevance uh, keyed in for the student. And you might even have to tailor the relevance to each individual student. So like for a student, it might be relevant this way but the, your lesson might be relevant to the, the, another, so not, another way, which I'll get to in a minute because we have different uh, gaming mindsets that uh, each student has. We have to structure the experience with a goal in mind, and we have to include individual and class goals. So it's not just about the individual, but bringing the class into the whole structure as well, which creates positive interdependence. That's why the math program that I showed you earlier worked, because the kids were all working together towards the goal, and when, when the class achieved that goal, then we had popcorn night or popcorn day or, or some sort of other reward that's that's that would really drive them toward it. And then you know if you can, you don't have to, but this is also a great one. Create badges, rewards, milestones, and even currency. So when they're doing stuff, they would earn currency, which then they could trade in for items, shops, passes. Uh, so so that gives them uh, the ability to to say, okay, you know, I earned this, now I'm going to be spending this towards something that I really want. So I'm going to. Uh, um, and, and then the uh, last thing is apply gamification that integrates choice. So give them choices, not just one way to get to the end goal, but, but think of multiple ways for them. Or they might even think of multiple ways to the end goal as well. All right, so you want to take your picture now? Go ahead. But remember, I'm going to send you this PowerPoint deck too. So, but if you want to tweet it, go ahead. Tweet it down too. <laughs> all right, so um, all right, everyone's done. All right, so, the, so you can take a picture of this guy. I'm not going to talk about this slide, but this is just more information. But this guy uh, I interviewed last year, and he actually gamified his classroom really effectively. So he created these uh, cards that the kids would then trade in for, and he has like a bunch of cards uh, that he laminated in it, and it's worth so many points. And they would be like, I'm going to purchase this card, and this card gives you the power to stack during class. Ooh, talk about superpower. Like, I could snack during class, yay! So, so like these little things mean a lot to the kids, and he has like other ones as well, which are really awesome examples. But, but these are coveted items, and, and to get this card, they have to do a lot of things to earn that card. And then when they have that card, they go, oh, I have this powerful card. Then they even have to decide when they want to use it. 
which is another psychological aspect of gamification as well. It's like, oh, I want to hold on to this and save it for a special occasion where I'm just going to use it now. So, so it's really awesome. And then there's this book that uh, I would recommend everyone read, which is um, by Ryan Shape and Nikki Mohan called Making Schools a Game Worth Playing. So this is chock full of ideas that I can't convey. Because right now I'm just kind of opening the door for you. I'm giving you a basic, better understanding of these kids. But really, if you want to dive into gamification, check that book out. It is absolutely amazing. Um, making school a game worth playing. OK, so let's look at the Myers-Briggs of games. Because like I told you, like you're tailoring it to the certain uh, personality type. So what Myers-Briggs are you? Uh, me, I am a INTJ when I take the Myers-Briggs test. So when it comes to gaming, it translates to be visionary mastermind. Uh, so I guess that's true because I have a very large big picture of things and I like to build worlds. And so when you look at each of these uh, INTJ elements, if you go to that website, then you will see how that gets defined and broken down into the games you play, what kind of strategies you like. So if you have your students take a Myers-Briggs test, then you can say, okay, well, you're an ESFP, so you're an enthusiastic improviser. You can look at that personality type, see what games they play, and then you go, okay, now I have a better understanding of what motivates you. And if you have a better understanding of that, then you know how to connect with them better. You know, so especially with the kids you, you don't really connect with, so you can say, hey, what's your IT, uh, what is your Myers-Briggs? And then they say, uh, I am INFP. Okay, all right, cool, let me look you up. Oh, now I better understand you in, in the video game terms, so this is really awesome. The next one is a really awesome called Quantic Boundary, and basically it takes you through a series of questions, and I would recommend that you have your kids go through this as well. And what it does, uh, Quantic Foundry, is that it builds a profile of your personality type of what kind of games you like. So as you can see, I like action games, I like immersion games, I like some social, and but I'm not really creative, I guess. So <laughs> go figure. Um, but, but this also paints a, a good picture of what motivates the kids based on their gaming uh, habits. So, you know, so there's a lot of these assessments, but if you know what kind of games they like, then this kind of gives you even a, a better glimpse into their minds as well. So this is me, uh, and you know, I'm at 69% mastery, so I'm not a 100%er. I'm a 69%er. So there we go. But I like those action games. Okay. So there's dozens of game genres, and they're all person tailored to personality types. So if we look at uh, one of the most popular ones called first-person shooters, you know, such as like you know Fortnite, Halo, Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, uh, Overwatch. You know, so first thing that comes to mind is well, you know, this is, these are aggressive games. They're very violent. You know, bullies play those games, uh, vindictive, and and we only get into the school school shootings. But uh, but so we think that um, you know this is it. But the thing is, these the kids who play these games are highly perceptive, they're team players, they have very fast reactions, and they're adapted to situations that change constantly in the game, in the aspect of the game. So these are skills that the kids are playing, building when they're playing these games. So it's not just about the act of, of, of destroying each other, but really, you know, these things that, you know, in order to be good at it, you have to be good at these various things. You know, MMORPGs, which stands for Massively Multiplayer Online Roleplay Games, uh, are like you know Diablo, World of Warcraft, which is a classic, Dota 2, Star Wars, Old Republic, and even Eve Online, which is a a financial simulator in space. <laughs> you know, you think of these kids like you know they're reclusive, they're passive, they're antisocial, but they're really they're team players. They have a strong understanding of economics. They're goal oriented because they have to have a goal in mind to get to those, those different parts of the uh, the skill tree. Uh, they're very digitally social because you have to work together with other people, great decision makers, and they're planners as well. And there's also other genres which I won't get into, but I will get into the, uh, uh, the, the two hour version of this uh, talk because we're at uh, five minutes left. Man, time flies. Um, so uh, tomorrow at 8.30, if you want to sit through this again, not, not this, but in greater detail, I'll we'll have guest speakers coming in who are who will be uh, experts in this field, but will also contribute to that session, 8.30, and tell your friends about it as well. Uh, so, you know, speaking of which, like this, this is another book by the same author, uh, which just came out, actually, so I just added it recently. It's called Game On, Using Digital Games to Transform, Teaching, Learning, and Assessments as well. 
So another great book to uh, check out. All right, so uh, so these are some of the other genres. I'm going to skip through here. So, you, so now it's part of the video, and then we have Minecraft, which uh, you know, uh, and then VR and AR, which is still an untapped potential. Uh, and I actually have a lot to say about it. All right, so basically, you know, we have about uh, four minutes for questions, which is awesome. So I made it through this thing in t on time. Did you guys have fun? Yes. Yes. Did you guys write 20 pages of, of notes? No. 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 Okay. You get a lot. Okay. Yeah, 20 pages were quite acceptable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you need, if you want to contact me, you can reach me through Gmail, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, if you want Instagram, I just started trying to do that, trying to figure that out. Uh, but uh, but this this is me with my colorful, crazy hair now. Um, and, uh, and any questions? Uh, that, okay, yes, sir. All right, so I completely get everything that you're saying, and the only thing that I have a question about is, like on the, the first person shooter, right? Yes. You have the aggressive, the bully, those are the students that I think not education-wise, but also like those are the ones that we deal with, I think, behavior-wise, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So how do you, I guess, what, what's the strategy for that generation as far as the social aspect? Because like, the biggest thing I find in those, in those chat rooms, right? Yes. They're using language, they're saying things that are not, that, that's a, a space in that world mm -hmm. and not in the real world. Yes. So how do, what are your thoughts about how do we make that transition for them so that mm -hmm. it's not acceptable for them to yell across the room and, and scream yeah, at somebody? Yeah, and, and actually that's a great question and there's a lot to talk about that, uh, which actually I would say if you bring that up in one of the eSports sessions, those teachers have some amazing strategies okay. on dealing with that because they have to deal with that constantly with the, when they're competing with each other, you're like, no, don't do that, don't do that right. aggressive behavior or whatever, because they're, they're so in the moment that all these things percolate out. And, and uh, they have stress, awesome strategies, but there's a lot of strategies to deal with okay. that. And, uh, <laughs> but you had a question too, so, yeah. but good question, and I would say talk to them about it. Yes. So not just limited to game player, but what about the whole culture of game player? Like, like G4 was yes. like a TV channel we all love, but died out and now has re-emerged online. <laughs> yeah, well, as far as, yeah, the culture, 